I was just doing my makeup for work, and I just wanted to tell you guys about how I don't think math is real. The year 2020 saw two major pop culture phenomena cause a stir in the world of mathematics. You just saw part of the first, a video that several of you have probably already seen, in which a teenage girl named Gracie contemplates whether or not math is real while doing her makeup. This video went absolutely viral, with many reading this young girl's musings as a reflection of America's failed education system. What was fascinating to watch in the aftermath, however, were the several high-profile mathematicians who came to Gracie's defense. They posited that Gracie was actually asking a profoundly interesting question regarding whether mathematics exists independently of human consciousness, or whether human beings simply created math for the sake of utility. And so, unbeknownst to her, Gracie's chipper, innocuous video was the first of two massively poignant contributions to the mathematical discourse of 2020. The second of which, on the other hand, came from the Netflix television series Alice in Borderland. Alice in Borderland is not quite as chipper. What is perhaps most fascinating to me is that while both of these worldwide phenomena could at first glance at least seem worlds apart, Alice in Borderland and Gracie's videos each attempt to explore the very nature of math itself. Borderland's universe is hyper-conducive to thought experiments, and while the show's simple premise of people who are stuck in Saw World need to beat scary challenges could have merely relied on entertaining its audience with blood and gore, the show writers drew from the best elements of the manga source material to deliver something truly thought-provoking and utterly breathtaking. While the show doesn't give any definitive answer to whether or not math is quote-unquote real, Borderland explores several different potential answers to this question through its gut-churning puzzles, as can be seen from the very first episode. This is a famed optical illusion that teaches us something about the difference between seeing and perceiving. If you stare at this image, you'll likely see this old woman, and I only say likely because there's also the possibility that you instead saw this young woman instead. Of course, regardless of which woman you saw at first, the actual matter and material composition of the image in front of you hasn't changed. In other words, what you're seeing is technically the same, but what you're perceiving is different. With that in mind, the first challenge in Alice in Borderland presents mathematical concepts as containing similarly elusive properties that take time and perspective to notice. The first challenge's properties are as follows. Arisu and his two friends find themselves in a big building, joined by this dapperly dressed lady and a schoolgirl. The group of five makes their way up an elevator and finds themselves in an enclosed room with two doors before them, one that says live and the other that says die. The rules of this game, as presented on the player's cell phones, are simple. Select the correct door within the stipulated time. After inspecting the doors and having a laugh at the absurdity of their situation, dark smoke begins to fill the room, and the timer on their phones reveals that the players only have 30 seconds remaining to choose the correct door. In a flustered state, the schoolgirl runs toward the life door, opens it, and gets shot in the head with a laser beam. <laughs> Oh, come on, Borderland, the door said life. Now that's just false advertising. After jumping into the die door, the four remaining players are presented with yet another set of two doors, and they must once again choose the correct one in order to survive, this time with even less time available than the last. Karube gets lucky and pushes his way through the correct door, but now all of the players are terrified, wondering how much longer they can keep up with this game of 50-50, wherein life or death seemingly comes down to a coin flip. And so you as an audience member are left with one burning question. If you were Arisu, how could you consistently pick the correct door in each new situation so that you could get out alive? The first solution that came to my mind the first time I saw this challenge involved a macabre use of social dynamics. If you can convince the other three players to choose the doors first, then you can hopefully get lucky enough to make your way out alive. I would never do that to any of my own friends though, so we run into our first practical problem right away. What's more is that this challenge is labeled as a three of clubs on the player's phones, which we will later learn signifies that this is actually a team challenge, which further suggests that sending in random people to die likely isn't the optimal route to success here. 
While the solution to this first challenge isn't quite as straightforward as those later in the series, Arisu's solution to this puzzle can basically be broken down into three parts. One, assess the dimensions of the building, two, assess the dimensions of each room, and three, assess which of the rooms result in a Spartan laser to the skull. First, let's explain the lay of the land. The geometric area of this building in which the game takes place is that of a square, which Arisu observes from the evacuation map near the elevator. Using the length of a car outside as a frame of reference, Arisu notes that if the car is roughly 5 meters, and the length of the building is roughly that of 4 cars, this indicates that the length and width of this square-shaped building creates a 20 meter by 20 meter grid. Next up, Arisu needs to evaluate the length of each room, which is simple enough as he can easily use the measurements of his own feet to create a rough approximation of each room as having 6 meter by 6 meter dimensions. So, if we know the dimensions of the rooms as well as the dimensions of the whole building itself, we can create a 3 by 3 grid of rooms that comprise the game floor of the building. You'll notice that 9 6 by 6 squares don't perfectly add up to a length of 20 by 20, but that actually factors into a twist that appears toward the end of the challenge that I'm not going to spoil because just in case you haven't seen it, I want you to see it, it's so good! Okay, but even if we do have the dimensions of the building, how can we figure out which rooms are safe and which ones aren't? While there's been mad speculation online as to how we can complete this challenge without the schoolgirl dying or someone being a hero, luckily for us, schoolgirl's death and Karube's courage have not only allowed us to get through two rooms scot-free, but we've also been given the opportunity to uncover the locations of the first two laser rooms by process of elimination. With this information at hand and by using mathematics to establish a geometric landscape, it now becomes possible to get through most of this challenge. In this case, Borderlands visuals help us understand that even though the tangible matter that composes the building is the same by using a mathematical or non-mathematical lens, the former provides Arisu with the tools to succeed. In this case, math is treated like a naturally occurring phenomenon that is always there, but like the cells of a plant or the atoms that compose a mountain, require a very specific lens to be observed. While this first challenge might initially have one conclude that the show's position on math is that it is in fact real and is a tool that is ultimately helpful for humanity, the show's fourth challenge adds a large degree of nuance to its portrayal of math by positioning itself firmly on the other side of the debate. If the first trial denotes how useful mathematical categories can be, then the running challenge in episode 4 shows us how numbers can be completely deceiving and detrimental. This challenge, simply titled Distance, begins with our heroes meeting up in a bus, at which point the game rules are stated. Endure the trial and reach the goal within the time limit. A two-hour timer is set, as well as a distance counter set to the value of zero. After some time is wasted trying to get the bus to work, our heroes determine that they need to make their way on foot, begrudgingly leaving behind one of their own injured teammates to start jogging onward. Their run is slowed by several obstacles, including some potentially poisoned water, some detours made by certain members of the cast, and a frickin' panther? Holy damn, this show is hardcore. Eventually, some of the heroes run into a literal brick wall, and having assumed they've made it to the end of their run, they kinda just hang out there while Arisu tries running backwards because he thinks he's found a way to fix the bus. What's funny is that at this point in the episode, the audience, as well as the characters, believe that Arisu is running farther away from the goal, when in reality, he's actually running back towards it. You see, as it turns out, the goal in this challenge was actually located within the bus the whole time, and the distance counter on their phones hasn't been measuring the total distance traveled, but actually how far our heroes were from the goal the whole time. In this case, the expectation set by a two-hour timer, as well as a distance counter set to zero, had the characters assuming that the numbers growing larger and larger was a good thing. Trust me when I tell you, this type of logical error, where numbers are used to confirm someone's pre-existing false beliefs, has so many real-world equivalents, it's actually pretty crazy. The primary example that comes to my mind is the cherry-picking fallacy, in which someone uses a very small and specific set of data to misrepresent the findings of a data set. I can think of two internet donkeys off the top of my head who have displayed egregious examples of this fallacy, the first of whom being Steven Crowder during one of his many attempts to prove that climate change is actually a giant hoax. In one of his videos, Crowder claims that a specific glacier in Greenland is actually growing, and he chooses to highlight this very specific spot in time as evidence, while either failing to notice or neglecting to inform his audience of the fact that it has actually been consistently melting for quite some time. Crowder has since taken the video down, 
without correcting himself, of course, because he's a coward. But there is an excellent response video from H Bomber Guy if you want more of a fleshed out account of Crowder's distortion of the numbers to corroborate his rubbish points. The other example that comes to mind is alt-right megamind Black Pigeon Speaks, who used a study to demonstrate that white people have gradually worse opinions of minorities the longer they're exposed to each other. The problem is that he failed to cite the rest of the study, which found that white people eventually found themselves warming up to the perceived outgroup over time. Linked below is a wonderful video from YouTuber Sean if you're interested. What's imperative to remember here is that none of the numbers that Crowder or Black Pigeon are providing are technically false, but if the distance challenges teaches us anything, it's that obtaining data is less important than being able to interpret said data. Borderland reminds us that if someone as brilliant as Arisu can fail to notice the giant goal sign on the side of a bus, then we too can be tricked into having numbers confirm our own pre-existing beliefs and expectations. Oftentimes, how you read numbers says more about you than the numbers themselves. If Borderland's first challenge is a covert argument that numbers are real, then the distance challenge is the antithesis to that proposition, highlighting that even seemingly a priori mathematical knowledge is susceptible to socially formed categories. Okay, so the light bulb challenge from episode 5 is my favorite challenge from the show, but it takes some time to explain, so bear with me. The goal of this game is to use the allotted time to determine which of these three switches turns on a light bulb that is located in this small room. Of the three switches available to the players, only one of the three lights the bulb. There are two big barriers to solving this problem, though. The first is that you can't have anyone standing in the small room with a light bulb while flipping a switch. This wouldn't be a problem were it not compounded by the second issue, which is where things get a little weird. You only get one chance to pull a switch while the door to the room is open for you to see the outcome. After that, you can freely flip the switches as much as you'd like, but after you flip a switch while the door is open, the door slams shut for every subsequent flip right before you have the chance to see if the light has been turned on. Now, some of you watching this may have noticed that this challenge actually has a lot in common with a classic mathematical conundrum that, when released to the public in the real world, caused quite the stir in the mathematics community. Let's spend some time talking about the Monty Hall problem. Monty Hall goes a little something like this. You're on a game show in which you can select one of three curtains, at which point you win whatever is behind the chosen curtain. You are told that two curtains have goats behind them, and one has this uh, new Lamborghini here. After selecting one of the three options, the game show host decides to create some drama by revealing a goat behind one of your unchosen curtains and giving you the option to switch your chosen curtain for the one that remains, with you keeping what's behind the curtain and disregarding the prize you've already chosen. The problem goes as follows. Should you keep your selected curtain, switch to the remaining curtain, or does it not matter whether you stay or switch curtains? Oh, and it goes without saying that as awesome as it would be to own a goat, you're trying to win the Lambo here, even though a Lamborghini isn't as valuable as knowledge. If you've never tried the Monty Hall problem, take a moment to pause this video and think about what you would do in this scenario. So, as it turns out, the correct answer that gives you the highest statistical probability of winning the Lambo is in fact to switch from the initial curtain to the new one. Without getting into complicated mathematical formulas, the easiest way to understand this problem is as follows. Imagine if I told you that curtain 1 definitely has a goat, curtain 2 definitely also has a goat, and curtain 3 has a car. Now, if you've chosen number one, you currently have a goat in your possession, meaning that once the other goat is revealed, switching your choice would be the winning option. If you choose the second curtain, the same thing would happen to you. You would choose the goat, the other goat gets revealed, and then switching to the car is your best choice. Only in scenario number three does it make sense to stay with your initial choice, and of course there's a two out of three chance that you opened with a goat in the first place, and only a one out of three chance that you opened with a Lambo. Here's a nifty little chart you can use to help solve this problem if you're still feeling a bit confused. It's totally fine if you're a bit confused, by the way, because, spoiler alert, many PhDs in mathematics were not only fooled by this puzzle, but they also sent a bunch of angry letters to the person who famously got the problem right. But more on that later. Ultimately, all you need to understand here is that if you switch your choice, you get a 66% chance of winning the car, and only a 33% chance to win if you stick with what you chose initially. Okay, so if we go back to the light bulb problem in Alice in Borderland, you're probably noticing some similarities between it and Monty Hall, and the show is very much aware of that, as can be seen in this nod to the classic puzzle. <laughs> Okay, 
However, the light bulb challenge and the Monty Hall problem aren't identical. In the latter, it's okay to walk out of the situation with a goat instead of a car, but if you fail a challenge in Borderland, you and every person in the room with you dies a horrible death. Yeah, you, you remember the girl who got shot in the head with, with the laser? Yeah, that's bad. So, how do we go from Monty Hall's 66% rate to a 100% success rate? Well, as it turns out, the math in this situation is only half of the battle, and practicality actually plays a huge role in the solution. If you manually close the door and flip the first switch, and then proceed to flip the second switch while the door is still open, you can win this challenge 100% of the time. The way to do this is by having someone go touch the light bulb after you flip the first switch. If the correct switch is the first one, then the bulb will still be hot. If the second switch is the correct one, then you'll see it light up because the door is still open, and if the bulb is cold and you didn't see the light go off with the second switch, then process of elimination dictates that the third switch must be the correct one meaning you can always get this right so long as you follow these steps. What I find so fascinating about Borderlands' spin on the Monty Hall problem is that it highlights some of the practical shortcomings of relying too much on mathematical theory instead of taking practical experience into account. If you were to remain within the strict confines of a math problem, then you would miss out on the practical application of a light bulb still exuding enough heat for you to perceive it if it were previously switched on. When you look to certain academic fields, there are many mathematical models that work so well in theory that have demonstrated demonstrably fallen apart in practice. From the hard sciences to sociology and economics, the examples really are endless. Another instance of math being at times blindingly counterintuitive is when Marilyn Vosavant gave her solution to the Monty Hall problem in a magazine article. After her solution was published, approximately 10,000 readers, including nearly 1,000 with PhDs, wrote to the magazine, most of whom claiming that Vosavant was wrong. This is despite the fact that Vosavant had not only explained her reasoning, but also, at the time, had the highest recorded IQ of all time. Yep, despite this, she was still mercilessly mocked by her male counterparts despite being entirely correct. I'm just so glad that we as a society have moved past mocking girls and women for making bold statements pertaining to the domain of math, I feel like we've really come such a long way and have really learned from our lessons to move past our judgments and... Man, I'm just really proud of humanity. We've come so far. What I find to be the actually most hilarious thing, though, is that these PhDs could have easily replicated the Monty Hall problem themselves before sending in these angry letters. I did so at a restaurant to prove it to my dad when I was like 12 years old using some table napkins. Had any of the PhDs in mathematics bothered to test out the Monty Hall problem in a practical sense, they would have immediately realized that their intuition was completely false. However, hubris is a strong force and instead they will forever be remembered as the close-minded buffoons that they were when presented with the truth. Alice in Borderland may not have an answer to Gracie's question as to whether or not math is real, but it does do a splendid job of introducing you to situations that are likely to give you a new perspective regardless of your preconceptions of the subject. In some of the challenges, math seems like the only way to get out of a tight spot, while other times its use seems to only blind people from obvious elements of their realities. In the show, math seems to at times be a useful theoretical framework, yet other times is useless on its own without a more practical mindset. At the end of the day, though, one thing is certain within the world of Borderland. Regardless of whether math is or isn't real, it is everywhere.